When someone begins to question their faith, the last thing church leaders want to do is say the wrong thing or handle it in a way that will further push them away. With so many historical concerns or doctrinal questions, what is a leader supposed to do? I'm happy to report that Leading Saints is here to help with the Questioning Saints Library. This is a full library of 20 plus presentations related to how to minister to an individual who is questioning their faith. We cover topics like how to answer tough questions, maintaining your relationships when someone leaves the church, and how to embrace doctrinal ambiguity. If you want to review all the sessions from the Questioning Saints Library at no cost for 14 days, simply go to leadingsaints.org 14. That's leadingsaints.org slash one four. While you're at it, we'll give you access to all of our virtual libraries that cover several leadership related topics. So click the link in the show notes or simply visit leadingsaints.org slash 14. C.S. Lewis was a British writer and theologian. He held an academic position in English literature at both Oxford University and Cambridge University. And well, a few months ago, a good friend of mine named Tyler Snow reached out to me and said, hey, Kurt, there's a book coming out called The Leadership of C.S. Lewis. And if you've been listening to General Conference the last few decades, uh, you've probably heard several quotes from C.S. Lewis. He's often labeled as the most quoted non-Latter-day Saint uh, in General Conference. And so I reached out to the author of The Leadership of C.S. Lewis. The subtitle is 10 Traits to Encourage Change and Growth. Her name is Crystal Hurd, and she agreed to do an interview. And since my good friend Tyler Snow was the one who started this conversation, I invited him to co-host the interview with me. And this interview is a little bit different. Uh, obviously, the book talks about various leadership principles and traits that C.S. Lewis had. He's often not... Th thought of as a leader. So we sort of talk about his history. And I think it's really interesting for Latter-day Saints to learn more about C.S. Lewis, the impact he had not on only our church, but on the Christian uh, world as a whole. And Crystal is, <laughs> I quickly learned, is the person to go to all things C.S. Lewis and had some interesting perspectives to share. So I'd love to have you listen and uh, give me feedback on this type of episode where we jump into a specific figure who is uh, sort of tangentially related to leadership and explore their life. So here is my interview along with Tyler Snow with Crystal Hurd, the author of The Leadership of C.S. Lewis, 10 Traits to Encourage Change and Growth. Today, I'm sitting down through the powers of the internet with uh, Crystal Hurd. How are you, Crystal? I'm great. How are you? Awesome. Now, we're going to be discussing your uh, recent book called The Leadership of C.S. Lewis, but I first have to introduce my co-host today. I don't typically have a co-host, and that is uh, Tyler Snow. How are you, Tyler? Not bad. How are you, Kurt? Good. Now, do you want to tell Tyler, the listening audience, how, how we're connected? How do we know each other? So in my last ward, I was one of the bishops in the stake and Kurt Franken was a member of the state presidency. So we right. got to know the stake or I got to know Kurt through that relationship. Yeah. And before that, we like when I was bishop, we were like next, our offices were next door. So we would go and cry on each other's shoulders on the <laughs> tough days. And, right. It was good. Talk about welfare interviews, all of that stuff. Yeah. And, and we'd often just sort of... Um, you know, talk about leadership, you know, inside conversations, you introduced me some, some great resources and whatnot. And you've always been a, a CS Lewis, a fan. And I think you originally sent me a link of Crystal's book and said, Hey, this book is coming out. Like you should reach out to the author and, and here we are. And now, and then I said, well, you gotta, you gotta help me out, Tyler. And so yeah. you're going to be my co-host today. So it should be, be pretty fun. Yeah, um, sounds great. Yeah. Crystal is a member of the um, official C.S. Lewis Facebook group. And I'm in that group as well. And she had posted that the book was coming out. And I thought this oh, is good. perfect for what you do and what I'm interested in as well. 
Nice. Very cool. So Crystal, I mean, what, uh, this was part of your PhD dissertation, uh, but what led to, I mean, when, when we think of CS Lewis, we don't always think leadership. So how did you marry these two worlds? Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, in 2012, I was, uh, studying for my EDD and educational leadership and policy analysis. Um, my, you know, day job is as a high school teacher, uh, teaching dual enrollment courses. And, um, you know, they kind of said, you know, you're going to be married to this topic for the better part of a year. <laughs> so you better enjoy what you're going to research. So I remember thinking, well, you know, I'd, I'd love C.S. Lewis and I'd love to do something on Lewis. Um, and I was actually um, attending a secular public university um, at that time. So um, I said, you know, this would be a good excuse to read all of Lewis's stuff and, uh, you know, kind of get something out of it. So um, I actually approached um, the dean of the department and said, you know, this is what I'd like to do. And he was like, absolutely not. No. Oh, no really? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> well, why, do, why did he respond that way? I, I think he just didn't want any religious affiliation. Oh, with, I see. Okay. Yeah. And so I went to one of my professors who is also a Christian and, you know, was like, I'd really like to do this topic. And she said, well, I'll share it. <laughs> so uh um we had to sort of craft this nice little you know it's not you it's me uh type thing for the dane and switch you know <laughs> switch over <laughs> um you know because that was her boss you know uh and sort of switch over to her and then she you know and then it was just like oh wow you know everything just sort of lined up and so um so i just it was it was great because i had a, it was really mixed really um i had a lot of people who said, Oh, that's a really great idea. And then I had a few who were like, no, (laughs) no, I don't think that, you know, he would not want to call himself a leader. And I said, no, that's true. I completely believe that. Like he would probably chuckle at the book title if he saw it, Um, (laughs) you know, but I think, um, you know, when I started studying all these leadership models and I thought, gosh, you know, he hits so many of these and not because he intentionally wanted to be a leader, but because he was a servant. Um, and because yeah. he was, you know, because he gave his life fully to, you know, to the kingdom. And yeah, so that he was was, the epitome of a Christian, right? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, and, uh, and that, that's how it, beca- you know, that's how he became a, a leader and he became so to so many, he was a mentor and a guide. You know, if you read, you know, the collected letters, which I know is not an easy beach read. Yeah. <laughs> it's over 5,000 pages <laughs> of correspondence. <laughs> so grab a Snickers, you know, when you, uh, but, you know, when you, when you read it though, it's, it, you see how daily he was instructing and guiding people. Uh, and all the while he was like, you know, he was very humble about it. You know, he was saying, yeah. don't, you know, I'm just another pilgrim like you are, but here's what I've learned from my reading of scripture you know, and here's, here's how I think you should handle that. And just through that, even, even just a a daily correspondence, um, he did that. But, but also I think a lot of his impact came from the wartime broadcasts, which became mere Christianity. Yeah. Yeah. So So in our, uh, in our faith tradition, I mean, we have a a strong, long history of people giving, uh, you know, sermons or talks and for decades and decades, we typically just quote ourselves, you know, a Latter-day Saint leader will typically quote another Latter-day Saint leader. But for decades, there's been this, this C.S. Lewis character that somehow, uh, you know, worked his way into so many talks. And it's sort of been the sort of this factoid that we share that, you know, the C.S. Lewis is the, the, the most quoted non-Latter-day Saint uh, in, <laughs> in Latter-day Saint uh, discourses. Um, and so, but I, I want if you could help us out, there may be people listening who aren't as familiar with C.S. Lewis or they've, they've heard this name and just assume he's a, a smart guy that, that lived long ago or something. So maybe you just give us a summary of who he was and sort of a, a life scope of him. Oh, well, C.S. Lewis was actually born in Ireland. He's Irish um, nice. from Belfast. Yeah. Um, and uh, so he grew up in a really interesting um you know, really with religious turmoil, uh, really surrounding him between Catholics and Protestants. So from, from a very young age, he was, 
he understood that there were, you know, differences and denominations and approaches to God. Um, and so um, I think that's kind of what led him to write Mere Christianity, right, was is sort of seeing how here, you know, we, we want to see differences, but look at all these similarities. You know, let's let's try to find some common ground with that. So um, Lewis was sent off. Um, his mother died when he was eight. Um she had abdominal cancer. His father was a police court solicitor, which I've done some work on his family. I'm actually working on a book now on the Lewis and Hamilton families and how they inspired the, um, he and his brother, Warney. Uh, but they, um, you know, they sort of, ra- they raised him in a, um, an Anglican tradition, which is like the church of England, um, Protestant. Um, and so after his mother died, he was sent off to England eventually to, to go to school. Um, during that time, he hated school. <laughs> he loved studying. Really? Wow. Yeah, he loved yeah, you studying. You wouldn't think he would, yeah. Yeah, he loved studying, but he hated prep school. Mm. He, he was an introvert, and he was not, you know, not athletic at all. Um, so, you know, um, so he didn't like that, but he loved to study. He loved sequestering himself in the library just getting lost in Homer, you know, um, which a lot of teenagers do. Just, just, <laughs> and sorry, yeah. I'm just, it's like none of my, none of my things. Yeah, yeah. At least back then, maybe they did. <laughs> in the original Greek, <laughs> like he is. Yeah. Um, but, you know, as a teenager, he sort of begged his father to go study with Kirkpatrick, um, William Kirkpatrick, who was his master, his um, headmaster, his father's headmaster. Um, so he ended up going there. Um, and uh, he was an atheist at that point. Um, a lot of a lot of things, including his mother's death, had sort of persuaded him, you know, against God. And so he kind of rebelled mm-hmm. against God for a while. Um, and then while he was training with Kirkpatrick, he ran across Fantasties by George MacDonald in a, in a train stall. Um, and that uh, just awoke something in him spiritually. Um, and so he was a World War I vet. Um, he, he was an incredible student of languages and literature. A- incredible. I mean, he, he quotes huge chunks of the Bible, even while he's a professed atheist. Uh, wow. when he's writing, he's writing to his father and his father, his father knew, but he didn't know, you know what I mean? He, like yeah. his father knew he was, <laughs> you know, his first book, the first book that Lewis ever published was Spirits and Bondage, which was basically atheistic poetry. And Lewis's father got it and said, this is not what a Christian would say, you know, kind of new, mm-hmm. but, um, and prayed for a soul a lot. Um, so um, eventually Lewis gains employment at Oxford University. He was studying at Oxford, uh, the war. He went and fought the war, World War I, um, came back and um, eventually got a job, became a Don there and uh, was writing marvelous literary analysis. I mean, just great stuff. And then he met J.R.R. Tolkien <laughs> and Hugo Dyson, and they profet, you know, they talked to him about the true myth. Um, and then Lewis said, it took it, t- it really took about two years for the whole thing to happen. And it wasn't like a, you know, one of those Christian movies where doves fly and then everything <laughs> magic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've seen a few Kirk Cameron movies in my day, but um, but you know, it's uh. It, you know, it, 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 it's like it had to hit it. It had to be processed through his mind first before it yeah. got to his heart. So um, eventually, you know, he was literally on a motorcycle, <laughs> you know, when he when he figured out that he was uh, he went from theism to Christianity. <laughs> oh, literally. really? Wow. Yeah. He was literally in Warney's sidecar. Warney's his brother, his older brother. And uh, Warney had a motorcycle and. Lewis, uh, as a lot of people know, doesn't drive. He didn't really drive that much. He occasionally did, but he um, he had a driver usually. Uh, and so, yeah, so he was sitting in the sidecar, and they were going to the zoo. And then he just decided God was real. <laughs> wow. I love that. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, he was on a motorcycle, right, um, when all that happened. And so basically that, that moment, which seems kind of insignificant, you know, I don't really have any spiritual experiences when I go to a zoo, but that, you know, this is, you know, and I haven't been to a zoo in a long time, but uh, yeah, that moment was transformative for so many, in so many ways, because then, then here he was this amazing mind and this writer. And then he started writing about spirituality and it just, 
resonated with so many people. Um, mm. And um, at that, I mean, you know, a lot of his stuff, cause he, he's, he writes on a wide, wide spectrum. Right. Um, yeah. you know, he, he wrote poetry. He wasn't super successful at it. Um, at least lucratively. Um, and then his first, the allegory of love was his first um, academic book. And that came out um, just shortly after his conversion. And then, um, then in the forties hit, here comes, you know, all the broadcast talks and uh problem of a pain, which was how he got the broadcast talks was, uh, was someone at the BBC had uh, read the problem of pain and said, this would be so great to, to talk to a, you know, a, an audience that is in the throes of a war and needs that sort of inspirational, you know, sucker to, to survive all this stuff. And so he ended up, he hated being on the radio, but he did it because he wanted to get the message out, you know, like you guys are. And, yeah. um, and so he eventually, you know, started writing more and more. And then in the fifties, here came Narnia. And, um, but there's so many, I mean, he was so prolific um, so many good things. So, um, there's a lot of ways to, now I, I'm actually very interested. Uh, what was the first thing you all read by Lewis? Oh man, I'm thinking, uh, I want to say the screw tape letters was probably what I read there first. Tyler, you've read them all like 10 times over, right? So <laughs> <laughs> not, not quite, but I would say when I was in third grade, I had a teacher that showed us the line Lewis in the wardrobe, the animated version of yeah. that. Yeah. So I read the book and that got me hooked at that point. Yeah. I've never, uh, I've read the, the, uh, the first book, uh, what's it, the magician's nephew. Is it, mm -hmm. I forget the title of it, but to my kids and, and, but I've never read the, you know, I've just seen the movies of the other ones. So, but yeah. yeah, there's so many different ways to get to him. And that's why anytime I talk to people and I meet people, you know, they'll say, uh, I actually met him through mere Christianity. Um, later on when I was older and mm -hmm. I, I, somebody just happened to, cause I, I went to a secular university for my undergrad for an English lit degree. And I was like, you know, I, I spent all this time studying all these wonderful, marvelous writers. And a lot of them had spiritual underpinnings, right? Dante and, you know, yeah. all these great mm -hmm. people. I was like, is there anybody that's alive? <laughs> that's like hundred years who does this stuff. And, and then someone said, well, you should try out C.S. Lewis. I don't know where that person is now. If I can remember, I will send them a fruit basket because uh, that <laughs> was life changing to me. And um, and then when I met yeah. him, I met Tolkien, I met McDonald, I met Chester Chan, I met, you know, all these, you know, Dorothy Sayers and all these marvelous people who were writing about the gospel in, yeah. you know, through a modern lens. And so, so yeah, that's sort of, so some, some people know him as a child children's book author you know, some people know him as an apologist. Some people know him, a few people know him as a, as a science fiction writer. Um, so, you know, just yeah. there's so many different ways um, to have met Lewis. But at the end of the day, he was just, he loved to write and he loved to imbue all these works with this, you know, spiritual perspective, um, this religious perspective. And, and that's what we know him for. Yeah. So you, you mentioned some of the leadership models that you've explored C.S. Lewis's life through. Is there one that you think is the most fitting when you think of C.S. Lewis as leader? What model do you think um, captures the best what kind of life that he lived? Um, I'm going to cheat and say transformational leadership because that's what I wrote my dissertation on. <laughs> <laughs> so I actually wrote it uh, on transformational leadership. And um, just as it suggests, it's about transforming people. Um, that leadership model specifically, um, it says, uh, like, it basically says in all the, and George McGregor Burns was one of the leadership, um, one of the leadership writers who wrote about that and actually sort of pinned that title, to, you know, that, that transformational leadership link sort of defined it. Um, and he talks about, um, those leaders are good at arousing the morale, um, and the motivation, of like of people. So, um, he, he says there's actually a moral component to that. Um, mm. so when we look at, you know, leadership as a whole, a lot of people see it as very transactional, right? I show up, I do this, I get this, um, transformational leadership is, is not at all transactional. It's, it's very much about understanding the person as a whole. And, um, not only, um, 
guiding them and helping them, but transforming them um, into better people, yeah. into, into their own leaders. Um, so for, for me, transformational leadership, I looked at there were like different components and, you know, one of them is charisma and um, intel, intellect, which I talk about a little bit in the book. Um, and, you know, there's an, an individualized attention. You know, here's a man who wrote every single person who wrote him, he responded. Like, yeah. can you imagine you're, you're amazing. You had to write back every single email that you were sending. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would get nothing else done. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know? Hopefully you got a lot less spam than we do with, with modern yeah. technology. But. <laughs> you know, so right. but, I mean, yeah. there's, um, I've actually seen um, and studied some of, uh, and my friend Charlie Starr is a, a handwriting expert, a Lewis handwriting expert. He's actually seen bits and pieces, like sometimes where paper was a little scarce, back during the war, he would just have these little bit, he would cut up papers into like smaller strips and then just write a couple sentences on there and sign it, <laughs> you know, cause he was trying to save paper. But even huh. if it was a brief response, it was a response. And um, wow. towards the end of his life, I mean, in the fifties, you know, he was writing two to three hours a day, just responding to letters. Wow. Wow. That's fascinating. And I love the, you know, the transformational component that if I just think generally about the various uh, writings that I've read or the quotes, you know, all these mic drop quotes that he he has out there that get passed around, like there's always at least some component of transformation to it, right? Like not only did he experience the transformation power of the grace of Jesus Christ, like he preached it so powerfully, right? And that's what I love about reading Lewis's quotes is just that wow, like I just feel the power of the grace of Jesus Christ mm -hmm. when he articulates Jesus. Mm -hmm. And that was his gift. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it he, really was. I mean, he, he said that in letters. He was like, I think this is the only thing I can do. Like he <laughs> yeah. basically said, teaching is in writing is the only thing I can do. He's like, I'm pretty much, I'm pretty much clumsy with anything else. And, uh, and we're like, no, you're doing a good job. You're good. <laughs> yeah. You know, <laughs> Keep on there, yeah. Jack. Keep doing it. You know, he was, you know, he was, he was really devoted to it. I mean, you know, and he, had, you know, honestly, you were mentioning the screw tape letters. You know, he had, he got a lot of criticism for the screw tape letters. No, oh, really? Yeah. Um, oh, like, I'm just uh, trying to figure out why. I mean, maybe giving voice to the adversary. I don't know. Yes. What, why, yeah, that's yeah. actually yeah. it. Yeah. Because, you know, when John Milton wrote Paradise Lost, a lot of people criticized him and said, you are, you are arousing sympathy for the devil oh, right? yeah. um, because you're talking about the fall and you're not focusing on, you know, you're focusing on mm. the fall and Beelzebub and all that. And um, so Lewis actually kind of does that as well. He sort of flips the script and he focuses on, Oh, this is what the devil would say. This is what, you know, this is what a devil in training would say. So a lot of people um, criticized him for that. And it, it's really interesting. I was telling my husband the other day, cause I have a, um, I have a copy of his time magazine um, cover in my mm -hmm. office. And, um, it's interesting because they play on that. Right. Um, if you've ever seen this cover, it's sort of a, you know, a, a drawing of Lewis with a devil on his shoulder and then like a wing. <laughs> oh, <laughs> really? Devil, yeah. But the devil is fully in the picture. The huh. angel is not. Um, so even, even time magazine was playing on that, you know, on, on this, you know, quote unquote advocacy of, of the devil's voice. Yeah. You know, they, they even characterize him as that. Yeah. He hated yeah. that. He hated that article. <laughs> he I bet. Yeah, yeah. He hated it. He, so many people were like, Oh, I saw you in town magazine. He was just like, Oh, it's all right. You know, yeah. he, was, he was really upset about it. He's like, don't believe a word you read. <laughs> he was uh -huh. not a big fan of the media anyway. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, he was, he was really, uh, yeah, he was, he was upset about that. He didn't, he didn't think they characterized him very well. Um, but it's funny. I mean, that was, it was interesting. They would play on that because that was the, so the opposite of what he was trying to do. You know, and he kind of got characterized as this, you know, man who's got a, a, a some inspiration about what the devil would think, you know, <laughs> yeah. you know, um, but it's funny. Now we read the screw tape players and we're like, this is brilliant. You know, yeah, it's, it's, it's a fun read. <laughs> yeah. So I'm curious, you know, going back to this transformational component of the type of leader he was, how he wrote, um, what perspective do you have on as far as the influence he had on bringing people to Christianity? 
Um, well, he, um, I think he spoke honestly and genuinely about the Christian experience. Um, mm -hmm. I like I, I myself um, was grew up in church and um, I was sort of raised in faith and I had one of those sort of crises of faith in my 20s, you know, where you question everything. And that's just part mm. of a lot of people's journey, faith journey, you know, just sort yeah. of checking, checking to make sure, you know, that these things are real, you know, to you. And um, so I sort of had that and. God very quickly showed me <laughs> that, you know, he was real. He was the real deal. I mean, um, and so I, I feel like, and I've had people say, do you think his atheism was contributes to, to his message of being a good uh, communicator? And I absolutely think that's true um, mm -hmm. because he can speak as someone who's lost, who had lost his faith and, and found it. Then he understands people's doubts and he understands those journeys we go through and the, you know, the questions that we want answered, you know, um, mm -hmm. um I remember like mere Christianity, the first like two or three chapters, I, like, I, I think I highlighted like whole pages the first time I read it. I'm <laughs> one of those people that like <laughs> writes all over the book and yeah. writes in the margins. I'm one of those, I'm one of those scoundrels, you know, that, that destroys a book totally, <laughs> you know, when I read it. And, um, I just remember being so it's like this person has reached across decades and across an ocean and across cultures. And he knows exactly how I felt. Mm -hmm. like, and to me that, that, that is, that's what Lewis does. He echoes the things that are in our hearts and on our minds before we even sometimes even have the courage to ask those questions. Yeah. Um, would, it, would it be safe to say that he was sort of a, a minister or a missionary to the to the intellectual crowd or the academic crowd? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, because, you know, I don't uh, again, I, like I, I kind of grew up in a in a very um, fundamentalist background. And so hmm. it's kind of like if you ask questions and people didn't know the answer, they're like, oh, you don't have enough faith. <laughs> Oh, and yeah. I was just like, yeah. no, no, like, you know, um, as somebody who'd went, you know, went to college and had enjoyed inquiry, right. And enjoyed, um, doing that and sort of interrogating all the things I read, you know, I said, no, I, I want to interrogate these things. And I think Lewis gave us permission and then he gave us the tools we need, um, to sort of critically approach these things and not feel like it's irreverent or feel guilty because we're, you know, trying God or something like that. You know, he, hmm. you know, he, I, I feel like the way he approached um, our day-to-day -day life and the issues we face and the issues, the, the, the issues of our faith as well. I, I feel like he was always um, authentic in, in the dialogue, you know, of, of what we struggle with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, yeah. And so I think that I think he gave us, you know, he gave he gave me permission to ask those questions, which I am forever grateful for because it made me a better person and it made me a better Christian um, to go ahead and and ask those questions because God can handle it. <laughs> yeah, I think he can. Yeah, I mean, he's the... <laughs> omnipotent. So <laughs> yeah. that's funny. He can handle a little me. But yeah, absolutely. And I think I think that was important because. A lot of people were, I mean, if you look at the timeline, um, you know, he was, he was part of that college going crowd and he was, and he yeah. was, you know, he was of, I mean, even in Belfast, even though there was a lot of working class there, his, he, his particular family was actually very sort of upper middle class. Um, you know, they had help mm -hmm. in the house and, you know, um, they weren't poor by any means, but, um, you know, he was he, because he had that intellectual background, he was able to adapt that message to different audiences um, and be successful. Yeah. Yeah. You had you wrote in your book about there was a, a tweet on Twitter where the son of a famous theologian questioned the relevance of C.S. Lewis to modern day Christians. Can you comment on why you why do you believe that C.S. Lewis is relevant to modern Christians? Hmm. Um, today, how can he still? He, how can he answer the questions of faith crises and people falling away from Christianity and religion today? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was an interesting. I got a lot of uh, when that tweet came out. That tweet came out like ten years ago, I think. But um, I my phone kind of blew up. 
<laughs> so many people hit me up and say, oh, my God. jump on it, Crystal. Save the day. <laughs> Pretty provocative tweet, right? I was yeah. like, okay. Like, um, you know, and I think, I think, you know, I think he's relevant because he, he, um, taps into the root of something that is fundamentally human and fundamentally spiritual. Um, not every writer can do that. Some, some writers are more timely, you know, it's like, um, you know, as, as a student as a, of literature, which most of my degrees are in literature and in writing, um, you know, we say what makes a classic, right? Like what, what, what makes a classic? Why do people still read Beowulf? You know, or why do people still read, you know, the Canterbury Tales and, you know, all the, and Gilgamesh, you know, why do we read all these things? And it's because there's this sort of taproot of, of wisdom that we can still pull from. Um, and I think Lewis is able to do that. Um, I do feel like um, in, in response to the tweet, um, I do feel like some people in my generation want to, and Lewis called this chronological snobbery, Right. Um, Lewis wanted, you know, a lot of people just say, well, that was in the past. That's old. That doesn't that's not relevant anymore. And I just feel like that's really unfair, <laughs> you know, yeah. to sort of like dismiss somebody because your dad's into them, which was kind of the case for this particular guy. Um, <laughs> this guy's dad was a major theologian who credits Lewis with, um, you know, as a major part of his inspiration. And um I was like, well, just because your dad's into it doesn't, <laughs> doesn't discredit, you know what I'm saying? Doesn't discredit Lewis. And um, if you look, I mean, how many people are in that group, Tyler? Like 20,000 people on that Facebook page? Um, yeah. For Lewis group? Ten, yeah. For there's a 20,000 people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's pretty amazing. Yeah. And, um, and there's so many like Lewis societies all over the world and people like, you know, wanting to, watch the movies and, you know, obviously this guy has something to tell us that's relevant. And so I feel like he, he kind of has that, he understood literature because he was a literary historian, you know, um, that was his day job, right. <laughs> I was teaching medieval yeah. Renaissance literature. So he knew the aspects of the old texts. Um, and he talks about that. He has a whole essay where he says, you know, I talk about the reading of old books, right, um, and about the wisdom from those. And I think he understood qu clearly, you know, what the fundamental things are about something that makes it relevant for every generation. And so to me, that's what he does. He taps into those needs and wants that are just emphatically human. And we don't grow out of them and we don't age out of them. You know, there's just parts of us as, as humans, as a humans made by God, that is just doesn't change. And he hits right on, you know, the things that are important to us, you know? Yeah. What would you say to, uh, you know, a, a modern day pastor or, or bishop or someone who's, who's leading a congregation of, of people? Um, is there like, is there a certain way they could really leverage uh, C.S. Lewis's writings and whatnot? I mean, is it for maybe that individual who's struggling with their faith, like, and maybe they're more intellectual or academic or, or not? I mean, is there any other advice you give as far as inserting the, the works of C.S. Lewis in somebody's as, as a leader, as you're leading other Christians? Yeah, well, one of the, um, and one of, I guess you read, you know, in my introduction, like one of the goals of the book was to sort of empower everyone from all, from all walks of life, uh, not just pastors or, you know, uh, yeah. managers and coaches. And, you know, I think all of us are ambassadors. Um, and when we go out into the world and we, you know, tell people we have Christ, then we are his ambassadors. You know, we are the ones who represent him. And so, um, uh, you know, I've, we've talked about this a lot, especially in the last couple of years, about the importance of kindness and love um, and drawing people to Christ. And um, I, I, I just feel like that was something that he did. Um, that was something like just in his day-to-day -day interactions, he was, you know, uh, th yeah, the most the most thoroughly converted man in England, right? Like <laughs> something as Owen Barfield <laughs> said, right? Um, he was a person who, once he committed himself to like the Christian lifestyle, 
that was it, game over. You know, he's he's on a hundred percent, and that means it's going to be painful or inconvenient or <laughs> difficult. <laughs> you know, on some days, but that was that was something that he wanted. You know, he felt you know he felt he had to empower other people to do that. So um, on one level, the you know in my book, I'm sort of talking about the fact that we. Um, a lot of times we want to default to other people like other leaders when really, you know, there's we have the power as individuals to help lead people towards a better lifestyle mm-hmm. by illustrating that and embodying that and living the biblical truths like he did. Um, and, you know, being in being in ministry is a tough job. Um, it's a tough job. So, you know, um, having a lot of the you know, I mentioned, you know, courage and humility and, you know, and, and a lot of the good qualities that I think that leaders really need to embody, which are all biblical, um, are things that I would, I would sort of encourage people to use, but, you know, it's, it's, it's not, it's not an every Sunday thing. It's an everyday thing. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. For these 10 traits that you, you refer to these leadership traits that C.S. Lewis exemplified how did you come up with these 10 are these are these 10 that are universal that you think every leader should aspire to or are these ones that were more specific to c.s lewis that he exemplified oh that's a great question um most of them came from leadership models um that i had that had you know worked on again the leadership models i used were all secular um but people like uh, the ones that I specifically mentioned, which were like authentic leadership, servant leadership, transformational leadership, all of those have a core of being moral and ethical. Um, and that's sort of like part of the, you know, part of being a good leader is having that innate, you know, that innate morality, that moral compass that sort of leads you. So a lot of them came from, uh, several of them came from um, some of the basic sort of transformational leadership traits and some of the ones that were mentioned. Um, and then a couple of them, um, like I was trying to think, there were a couple of them that are, that creativity um, was one that I kind of threw in because um, creative leadership now is um, on the come up really. And there's, there's a lot of talk about, especially with the pandemic and everything, you know, we were talking a lot about how can we, you know, in church or, you know, in school, how can we continue this instruction without meeting together? Right. How can we, you know, we need to be creative and in, in how we handle, you know, being apart, which was, you know, was, was such, was part of our lives for a year and a half, you know, <laughs> you know, and I don't know. Um, I know you guys are out West. I don't know if, if you are meeting in person now, are you all back to being yeah but now we are yeah but yeah, definitely yeah, there was a time a long time where we were not <laughs> yeah yeah it was yeah. it's it's very so creativity was kind of one I, I put in and perseverance i think um was one that I, I wanted to put in because you know every leader has failed at some point yeah and um i think it's important um that you know in our leadership training you know they say you know failure is is a breeding ground for greatness you know you you need to fail and you know, you have, you have to be criticized and go th- sort of go through that. And that's just part of being a leader, you know? Yeah. Um, so, um, so I sort of added those and I talked specifically about Lewis sort of failing creatively. Right. And I talked about when he, uh, when he wanted to be, a, he wanted to be a poet so bad and he just, he just, um, he just couldn't sell the books, you know, <laughs> you know, he wanted to do that. And when he switched to, to prose, it was, it was just so natural. I'm not saying he's a poor poet. He's an, he's an all right poet. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Probably better than all of us, right? <laughs> oh yeah, oh, definitely. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of ideas. He was working them out, you know? <laughs> yeah. That, yeah. As, as we all do. Right? Once, once the conversion happened, a lot of things got better. <laughs> yeah, <I bet. laughs> not just his lifestyle. His writing too. His writing actually got a lot better. Um, you know, uh-huh. um, cause he was, he was, and he talks about how he, even when he wrote a, uh, when they republished it in the fifties, I think he wrote this, this, you know, thing for it. And he was just like, I was working out a lot of my adolescent anger in this, <laughs> you know, he, <laughs> he basically says that, you know, so it's, it's kind of neat. Yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. we, so we see Lewis sort of 
you know, even as an angry young man, I mean, you know, there, we see those, you know, those, those things that we felt and were dealing with and early in life. And we see that he was echoing those too. And he was working those out too. And um, I always mention that Lewis is one of the few writers that can walk us through the whole journey, right? We can start in Narnia. um, And then as we go older, you know, we can get into more of, you know, the, the more adult works and into the apologetics and he can walk us through the journey for our whole lives um, and sort of leading us spiritually and not yeah. everybody can say that. Yeah. And you mentioned uh, early on in this interview and also in, uh, in the book is that, you know, that C.S. Lewis would probably be so confused why someone would write a book about leadership and him. Right. And, and he did have some, he did have some formal leadership roles on, on different committees or, or, you know, in his uh, academic roles and whatnot. But um, what, what would you say as far as the dynamic of somebody like Lewis, who, who he, he wasn't this great pastor or, or leader per se with all these titles, but he still exude leadership. Like what can we learn about better being a leader without having a title? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was, um, yeah, he hated, um, hated, like the normal stuff. He was, he actually was vice president. I mentioned this in the book. He was vice president a little bit for a little while. Um, and they kind of kicked him out of the job. He was not good. <laughs> was like, yeah, he was dictating letters and stuff like that. They kind of abbreviated his time <laughs> at the college. Cause it was one of those deals where they kind of pass it around, you know, the different people and it sort of alternates between people. And he was like, Oh, good grief. You know, um, in my turn. Um, so he, he, you know, he didn't really enjoy that, but I think, um, I think, you know, it has a lot to do with, uh, like I said, just sort of the daily walk, um, with him because he, he understood because he'd been on both sides of, of the debate. And one of the things I want to mention, the Oxford Socratic Club, um, because he welcomed atheists and agnostics to that meeting. Um, and as I mentioned in the book, you know, there were some meetings that had 80 to 100 people in attendance, hmm. um, you know, to watch these debates and to sort of soak up, you know, the wisdom of what was being said. Um, and he welcomed that. Right. I mean, we're, we're kind of in a time right now where people don't want to hear divisive opinions and they want to get really upset about it. And the mm-hmm. truth is, like, you know, you know, we 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 understand each other better when we listen. Right. Instead of talk too much. And so he was I think he exemplified that they said he was always incredibly courteous, um, even to people who wildly disagreed with his premise, <laughs> you know, whatever. They said he was always a gentleman. He never got angry or belligerent. Um, you know, he was just, he always just sort of lived what he believed. And that's really what made the difference. Um, he, I think because he was so um, obedient, you know, he was asked to do a lot of things he did not feel comfortable doing. He, did, he didn't want to be on the radio, um, but he did because he felt like that was, you know, he was actually on a show called Brain Trust um, that was on the BBC um, a couple of times. Dorothy Sayers wow. also was on that show. Uh, yeah. So he was. Yeah. And he was people just loved him. I mean, you know, uh, <laughs> people love listening to him. He was just a smart guy. And um, there's so many stories. And I put a couple in the book of where you know, he would be out somewhere. Um, I think I, I talked about the cab driver talking about him sitting at a restaurant with like a bunch of overnight truckers and just like being in the middle of this huge guffawing crowd making jokes. And, you know, um, because he was from, you know, the working class in Belfast, Mm. he, you know, had that, you know, the common touch as Rudyard Kipling would say, you know, and um, he was able to speak with people on all levels. Um, and that just increased his influence because he, you know, he didn't, he never thought, and then many people said this, he never thought he was better than anybody else. Um, yeah. So he, he embodied the scripture, right. And, and what it is to be a believer. And I think that was, he would still say, I mean, if, if we could examine him right now, I mean, he'd probably be like, nah, that's hogwash. <laughs> <laughs> He'd probably be like, no, Crystal, no. Um, but, you know, look around and see all the wonderful things that uh, and p- that people are doing, you know, um, in in his honor and his name and, you know, and doing things and coming together. And it's it's amazing um, what his legacy is doing. Um, and I don't believe that's an accident. 
One, one thing you mentioned earlier was the servant leader model of leadership. And, you know, I think he exemplified that pretty clearly. One, ex- one example of that is the, you know, two or three hours a day responding to people's letters. What, what are your thoughts on finding a balance between being the servant where you're, you're willing to help people writing, responding to letters or in, in modern times, responding to texts, emails, phone calls? How do you find the balance between being that servant where you're trying to help people around you that, that do need help, but also establishing boundaries for yourself, whether it be in a, a church situation or whatever situation it might be? Mm, that's a really great question. Um, that's a great question. Um, I think one of the one of the important um, things about servant leadership and transformational transformational leadership is the creation of leaders. Um, right. If we look at like tyranny, right, it, it that that model, that autocratic leadership says, I'm the one in charge. I'm a micromanager. I want to do everything. Um, a transformational and servant leader will say, I'm here for you, but I want you, I'm going to push you to do, you know, to go out and do those things. I was talking um, with the lamppost listener a couple weeks ago about um, the line, the witch in the wardrobe where Peter has to fight the wolf. Right. And he's like, Oh, Aslan, help me. And Aslan's like, no, you have to do this. This is your mm. job. If you want to be King of Narnia, this is the time where you buck up your courage and you do it and you do what's best, even if you're scared. And so he makes leaders out of Peter and, and, and eventually Edmund and, you know, Prince Caspian. Uh, there's some great leadership lessons in Prince Caspian, but um, you know, he, he sort of like, he makes those leaders. So I think one way that you could, um, that you could try to bounce it. And I completely understand because my husband's a, a school administrator and he can, whoo, you know, I mean? <laughs> everything is like, this needs to be done right now. You know, <laughs> um, yeah. one of the things um, is about sort of delegating to people. Like one of the ways that you, that you foster leadership is that you find out what a person's skill and talent is. And then you sort of delegate to that person and say, you know, Hey, this is, this sounds like something you'd be really good at. Um, so, um, that's one of the things I would recommend for people, um, is to sort of delegate, find people around you, get, like, get people around you who are great at what they do and, and compassionate and, and, and do that, you know, in, in the school, cause I, you know, I work as a, at a high school, you know, I have, I have English degrees, you know, people upstairs have math degrees, people down the hall have history degrees. Like we all have different competencies, but when we come together, we complement each other. So it's it, like, I feel like the church kind of works that way too. Um, Cause I've done, um, I've done worship arts before uh, in church. And so it's like, this person can sing and this person can play bells and, you know, this person can read and this, you know, so, um, and this person makes the bread. <laughs> you know, It's just like, you know, whatever, whatever you've been given, um, use that to God's glory. Um and so I feel like that's that's kind of one one way because you're absolutely right. You can it can swallow you up if if you're not careful, um, you know. And but there are ways to serve others, but in the meantime, also you can serve them by building them up a, as a leader, um, yeah, and helping sort of delegate and and enhance their leadership skills because you know we're we're finite human beings, right? We're we're not going to live forever, um, and what we do and our legacy. Uh, and our legacies in Christ is what remains after we're long gone, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, um, so it's really about, you know, it's, it's, like I said, as a teacher, that's something we talk about a lot. It's like, you know, like help these kids, del- you know, build them up so that, that when they leave you, they can do a lot of great things on their own. Um, you know, kick them out of the nest, let them fly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, so yeah, I think, but it, you're right though. I think um, it's pr- it's it's probably a, one of the situations where you need to be prayerful about what those boundaries are and protect those boundaries because um, I know with people who serve in ministry, mental health is really important, um, and you can give till you're poured out, right? So yep. Um, so it's important to keep to keep something in your you know, keep something in and, and build up too, because I've, I've been in that. And honestly, I've been in that position myself where, you know, I've been in worship ministry and you pour out so much and then you're empty and then you, you can't serve God to the degree that you want to, because you're so exhausted, (laughs) you know? So yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. Great question. 
And I sort of have a random question, but something you said uh, spurred it on in my on my mind. But um, he was, you know, he's such a deep thinker and had such a way with words and articulating concepts. And and maybe he would articulate a a doctrine or a religious concept in a way that uh, almost seemed brand new, just how he was framing it and talking about it. And so, do do you think he had any? radical beliefs compared to or maybe that the the common christian community would would say that some of his beliefs of christianity were more radical or or you know atypical there's a there's a couple um he he does admit in some of his letters that he thinks there are parts of the bible that are allegorical um Mm. like uh some of the old testament stuff not all of it um but you know um he does wonder if it's you know sort of an old, you know, like sort of the, the passed down version versus, you know, um, and there's a great book by Michael Christensen on, um, it's, it's, it's a few years old, but he, he wrote a great book called C.S. Lewis and scripture. Um, so mm-hmm. you can check that out. That's, that's, that goes into a lot more depth about his, you know, views on scriptural inerrancy, um, and things. He also mentions in a couple places that, that, um, he was not, um, he was, he was not an evolutionist at all. I mean, it, um, you know, he was not a Darwinist, <laughs> but he stretched the imagination and, you know, he and Freud had a lot of disagree on, <laughs> he, was a, he was a big fan, but you know, like he, he does talk about that maybe parts of evolution were God designed. So like maybe God designed, you know, animals to evolve in a certain way. I'm not saying mm-hmm. about, you know, like, uh, you know, us from monkeys or not necessarily, but, you know, he says maybe yeah. God creates, um, you know, for example, I have a friend who works in um, science and he studies um, like snakes and stuff. Eh. Uh, <laughs> not my deal <laughs> at all, but um, he was talking about if you have a, um, he was telling us a while back that if you have um, a, a creature that stays in a dark cave, um, it'll eventually kind of go blind because it adapts to the darkness. Um, mm. and it, it, you know, so it's like these sort of capabilities where you evolve to survive or you evolve to adapt to your environment. Like he, he felt that those, you know, could be something that God designed. Right. Um, so, you know, you know, but I, I, he never ever talked about monkeys or, you know, that, yeah, yeah. that type of evolution, but he did feel yeah. like maybe so, certain evolutionary things that occurred maybe just because, you know, God created us to be adaptive. You know, being, yeah. but yeah, no monkeys or anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, a lot of things we've, we've talked about with C.S. Lewis, obviously, you know, we're, we're, I mean, he was a remarkable individual, obviously a saint and, you know, we, we almost prop him up too much, but he was a deeply flawed individual as well and had his own struggles and whatnot. Anything to say in, as far as his personal struggles and, and that sort of this, uh, the, as he, you know, was reaching for a Christ-like uh, habits, even though he's a, mo- a mortal. Oh, sure. Yeah. Of course, uh, just recently, um, it has come out that um, he did have a relationship with Miss Moore, a sexual relationship. Um, there are some people who still debate that. Um, I sort of feel like m- m- me personally reading the letters, um, I do feel like he was very, he had a very I don't know, uncomfortable or uncharacteristic relationship with her because she was in her 40s and he was in his 20s and he was writing her pretty much every day when he would go into Belfast to visit his father. And also um, the letters that she wrote to him did not go to little Lee where he was living. They went to Arthur, his friend Arthur's house so that his father wouldn't get the correspondence. So to me, that's like, you're obviously trying to hide something if you don't want your dad to see the, you know, the letters you're getting from this 40 something, you know, year old woman. And um, you know, and of course, as you probably know this, but, you know, um, Walter Hooper passed away of COVID um, about a year and a half ago. Um, and, and a lot of that stuff was sealed until after his death. Mm-hmm. Um, so once he passed and we have a lot more stuff that's going to be coming out. Um, there's a lot of cool stuff on the horizon. But um, uh, well, that was sort of one of the things that was released after Walter's death was that he did admit to having a sexual relationship before he converted to Christianity. After mm-hmm. he converted, he stopped, um, which is probably why Miss Moore 
didn't like Christianity. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, she was not a she was not a spiritual woman at all. I mean, Warney was just like, what do you see in her? You know, she's <laughs> she's he never he never got along with her um, you know, because he moved in later into the kilns when she was there. And um, he, he, you know, he could, you know, take her or leave her, you know. Um, but, you know, he I think he was a young he was young and impressionable. You know, she probably presented herself and was a was a mother figure to him. He does call her mother in later letters, like post convert mm. um, and did take oh. very good care of her. But, yeah, I mean, most likely it is. But like I said, there's still a lot of debate going on about it in the Lewis community. Some people still believe that they did not have a sexual relationship. Some of them do. Um, I really don't care either way. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, we all sin all the time. So, it's like, you know, yeah. we, and we get back up and that, you know, that's, you know, that's the grace of God, man. It's just, you know, so to me, it really, I don't, I don't pay attention to it. And honestly, you know, I think about things that he wrote, like, I mean, he wrote about Christian morality and mere Christianity. He wrote about Christian marriage. Right. Um, and he wrote that great, um, there was a great essay, um, called we have no right to happiness which is about um casual sex and how we shouldn't be doing that because it damages the spirit um mm-hmm. and i think looking back on now that we have you know basically sort of confirmed you know stuff about probably what that 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 relationship was real to me it you know to me it only makes lewis's lewis's words even more emphatic because he experienced that he knew what it was like to be in a, in a situation, where, you know, with casual intercourse or whatever, because he had he had experienced that as a, a young man and he knew how how horrible that was to your spiritual well-being. Right. So he can he was writing with authority. Does that make sense um, yeah. about these things instead of just sort of like, I'm going to give you a righteous you know, sermon today. <laughs> That's yeah. something I've never experienced, you know. Um, now, looking back on a lot of the things he's written, you know, he did experience a lot of those things. And so he was talking from experience um, with the authority. And, and and as a sinner who struggled every day, you know, he could say to other people, yes, I understand your struggle. It's hard, <laughs> you know. But it, for me, it, it just made me, you know, sort of admire him more because, you know, he like like you said, so many people say, oh, St. Clive. Right. Um, and he was he was just as human as you and I living every day, you know, drinking pour it, smoking a pipe, just riding his heart out, you know, um, trying to do the best he could every day. And um, and that's what we're all just trying to do, oh, minus the cigarettes and port and stuff. But, <laughs> 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 but I think it's what we all try to do is just, you know, we, we just read the word and try to be good people and follow, follow scripture, um, and help, help each other. Just, yeah. just continuing that thought briefly, you know, in the letters that he would write with Arthur Greaves when he was young, he would talk about his, um, sexual impurity mm-hmm. that he was dealing with at that time, his addiction, mm-hmm. uh, at that time. Right. Um, and is there a sense that he was kind of a wounded healer? Do you get that sense from his, life and his writings? Oh, certainly. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I mean, for me, that's why he has so much relevance um, because he's experienced all these things. And, um, you know, um, we, one of the things that like I, I, I do in the education world is we talk about trauma. A lot of us in the education are being sort of trained on trauma, dealing with trauma. Um, and, you know, one of the things that, that works so well is where you can sit down across from a kid and be like, I know what you're dealing with. I dealt with that at your age. Um, Mm -hmm. There's something just incredibly powerful about saying, I understand because I've been there. Cause you know, I remember, I remember as a kid, um, like I remember when I went, like I said, I went to a pretty fundamentalist church and you know, some people are like, well, I don't really deal with sin that much. (laughs) 
<laughs> I don't know what you're doing with. <laughs> you know? yeah, I remember, hard to relate to that. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, I remember I was like listening to DC talk, you know, back in the 90s and, you know, the newsboys and all that stuff. And they were just like, oh, that rock and roll stuff is not Christian. And I was like, yes, it is. It's like, it helps me, you know, get through all yeah. my teenage angst, you know. <laughs> they were just like, you know, one lady was like, well, God only loves the bluegrass. That's what I was told. And um, I was just like, uh, <laughs> No, um, no, that's weird. You know, I mean, you know, it's, there's something, uh, there's something about, there's something, you know, about sort of getting on someone's level and saying, I look, I survived that, you know, I went through that and I survived and, and I can, you can do it too. Um, and like I said, I actually teach at my alma mater, which is where I graduated from 25 years ago, uh, <laughs> nice. which is great, which is crazy. Um, to me, but um, you know, one of the things that I like to do because I, I teach at a school that um, has a lot of poverty and stuff is say, "Hey, man, I was just like you. I, I I grew up, you know, and we didn't have a lot of money, but I worked really hard and I strived and I stayed focused, and you know, and you can do that too. You know, you can you can work your way out of that too. You know, and there's something really powerful in somebody saying, you know, I've dealt with that." Um, and for me, that's what, like I said, it humanizes Lewis when I read about all the things that he was dealing with, even while he was writing these amazing works of literature, right? Um, some of his daily, his daily life was tough, it was hard. I mean, he was getting criticized. Like I said, I mean, the Time Magazine article basically all but, you know, defamed him. You know, um, he was, you know, he was really frustrated at that, you know, because he didn't want to be famous, but, but if you're, if you have this platform, you can reach more people. So he was really reluctant to do that. But, um, you know, but he knew that was sort of what he was, you know, I don't know. A lot of people know this. I mentioned this in the book, but, um, when World War II rolled around, he wanted to do war work and, um, they asked him to work for the propaganda office. Um, and he was like, nope. And he turned it down. Wow. Um, cause he said, I'd, I, I'll have to write lies. And that just seems to be a horrible waste of my gift. Yeah. Is wow. to write lies. I can't go to bed at night having written lies, even if it's for the good of the country, <laughs> you know? So he ended up, you know, being on the home guard in Oxford, um, and sort of just walking around at night, you know, uh, and he was, you know, in doing the talking with the RAF, pilots and doing the mere Christianity broadcasts, you know, the, so he, he did a lot of war work, you know, <laughs> it was just, it wasn't with a gun anymore. Um, but yeah, he turned, he turned that down because he was just like, I don't, I can't write lies. I can't yeah. sleep at night knowing that I've, you know, I'm taking this thing that God's given me and I'm, I'm twisting it yeah. you know, and sort of, you know, making it, you know, making falsities about, it. you know, it was, you know, that's the kind of guy he was, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Crystal, this has been uh, fascinating. I really appreciate your research and, and you putting this book together. Anything you'd say as far as if people want to check out the book, obviously, you know, it's available online and, and uh, Amazon and whatnot, but, uh, or if people want to le learn more about your research, anywhere you'd send them. Sure. Um, I do have a website, which, Woefully, I don't up, update very often, <laughs> uh -huh. but it's uh, Crystal Herd, uh, C R Y S T A L H U R D dot com. Uh, so you can check me out there. I'm also on Twitter. Uh, my handle is at D O C T O R H U R D. And I'm also on Instagram under that same handle. Um, I just post a lot of book and dog pictures mainly there. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. <laughs> but I do talk about um, some of the stuff because uh, some of the additional things I've, I've talked about with Lewis is Lewis and gender, um, which I've done a chapter for the Lewis and women book on that in 2015. And then uh, my most recent research is on the Lewis family. Um, so I've got um, I'm actually in negotiations now with the publisher for that book. And there's a lot of cool stuff in his family. So I'm really excited about getting that out in the world. Nice. Well, my last question for you, Crystal, is as you reflect on uh, just your research and, and your own journey of leadership, you know, even in the context of studying uh, the life of C.S. Lewis and his leadership, how has uh, being a leader helped you become a better follower of Jesus Christ? 
Oh, wow. That's a great question. Um, you know, my first chapter was humility and that was intentionally done. <laughs> <laughs> um, I feel like humility is the first thing, the first thing um, to humble yourself. Uh, Lewis writes about it in Mere Christianity. There's a whole chapter, you know, right. Um, on the great sin, which is pride, which he feels is the worst sin. You know, he feels like that's the worst mm -hmm. of the deadly sins, right. Is pride. And, um, you know, um, without sounding too much like St. Augustine, um, <laughs> <laughs> we are, we are nothing without Christ. We are nothing without Christ period, full stop. Um, we, we, deserve so much worse than we have. And we are incredibly blessed, um, you know, by God. And so, you know, I think part of, part of what's really hard, I think day in and day out is to kneel and just say, you take it. And I feel like for leaders, that's the first thing you should do always is kneel, um, kneel before God and, and, give everything you have to him. Cause I, I, that's what Lewis did. You know, he, he didn't want to do all that stuff. He just wanted to sit in a library and read books. And, you know, he became this, you know, sort of Christian icon accidentally really, <laughs> you know, because, um, because obedience was like the first thing in his life. And so, um, what he's taught me, um, more than any of the, of the leadership experts is that kneeling is, is job one. Um, that is job one. And when you, when you see the world through God's eyes, um, it completely transforms the way you see the world and the way you see other people. Um, you know, like there's, you know, there's a lot of people that I see online who are just really angry all the time about, you know, about things. And, and sh yes, there, there are things that would, that grieve God's heart, you know, they're happening in this world. But I also know that he is, you know, the great healer and that he's in control. And at the end of the day, um, that, you know, I cling to him. He's my, he's my anchor. He's my rock. And, um, so all of us, that's what we do. We, we, we kneel and then we go out and we try to do good every day. You know, that, that's, uh, that's how I feel like, it, the, this research has impacted me. Um, you know, I mean, Lewis read the Bible every single day. You should, I mean, look at his letters. He, he quotes generously from the Bible. I mean, just pulls stories out. I mean, it's just, it's a marvel, you know, um, to have his words so on our hearts, you know, um, it's amazing. And I just hope that I can, you know, I can live like that every day. That concludes this episode of the Leading Saints podcast. We'd love to hear from you about your questions or thoughts or comments. You can either leave a comment on the uh, post related to this episode at leadingsaints.org or go to leadingsaints.org slash contact and send us your perspective or questions. If there's other episodes or topics you'd like to hear on the Leading Saints podcast, go to leadingsaints.org slash contact and share with us the information there. And we would love for you to share this with any individual you think this would apply to, especially maybe individuals in your ward council or other leaders that you may know who would really appreciate the perspectives that we discussed. Remember to access the Questioning Saints Library for 14 days, visit leadingsaints.org slash 14. It came as a result of the position of leadership which was imposed upon us by the God of heaven who brought forth a restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when the declaration was made concerning the own and only true and living church upon the face of the earth, we were immediately put in a position of loneliness, the loneliness of leadership from which we cannot shrink nor run away and to which we must face up with boldness and courage and ability.